We're going to be looking at this lab, DOM XSS using web messages and a JavaScript URL. We're going to be assuming some basic knowledge of web messages. Feel free to check out the previous Port Swigger lab if you'd like to recap on web messages. Basic idea of the lab is to exploit a vulnerability that is triggered by web messaging and the objective is to call the print function on the lab. All right, without further ado, let's fire up the lab. Okay, so we're here in the main page of the lab. Let's check out the source code for this page. Looking at the HTML, the first thing we notice is that there is a script tag on this page. Inside, we have an event listener and it's listening for a web message. We have a callback function associated with this event listener. It's receiving the event as an argument. It's then assigning the variable URL to the value of e.data. Event.data is simply the value of the web message. It's then running a check on the web message. URL.index of HTTP is larger than minus one. And then the same check for HTTPS has to be larger than minus one. If that check is true, then location.href is set to the value of URL. So in summary, we have a web message which contains URL in string format. A certain check is run on that URL. If the check is successful, then location.href is set to the value of URL. In other words, the user's browser is directed to the URL contained in the web message as a string. The next obvious question is, what is that check doing? What is this URL.index of HTTP is larger than minus one? Quick recap of the JavaScript method dot index of. It's one of the methods that lives on JavaScript strings by default. It also lives on JavaScript arrays by default. And there are some similarities between strings and arrays in JavaScript. We're familiar with the idea of an array having indexes, positions in the array where various pieces of data are stored. Well, strings also have positions where various pieces of data are stored. It's just that each piece of data is a single character in the string. The index of method, when it's called on a string, takes a substring as an argument and returns the starting index of that substring from within the string itself. So we have a simple example on MDN, const paragraph equals followed by a string. We have a search term dog, then we call index of on paragraph, which is the string and pass the search term dog. Now the D, now the D of the substring dog is appearing at character 16 or index 15 of the string. That's the value we're going to get returned from the call to index of. Now, assuming the substring is not found within the greatest string, then we're going to get minus one return as a result. It means there wasn't a match in the string for the substring. Returning to our page source, we get a feel for what the check larger than minus one represents. It means there's a match because minus one would be returned from index of if there was no match of the substring within the string. If there is any kind of match, regardless of the position within the greater string, we're going to get a value returned that's larger than minus one. In other words, when translated, this check determines whether the substring HTTP or HTTPS is found within the greater string, the web message URL. What is the idea behind this check? Well, if the string contains HTTP or HTTPS, it must be a valid URL. Therefore, it's safe to set location.href to the value of that URL. However, there is a little bit of a problem here with this check. One of the things that you may or may not be aware of is that it's possible to assign more than just a URL to location.href. A little bit similar to using an anchor tag in HTML. We have a href attribute, but that href attribute will take more than just a URL. It can also take what we can refer to as JavaScript colon, which is going to allow us to execute JavaScript directly. And we can also assign the value of location.href to JavaScript colon. If we put this inside double quotes, location.href equals JavaScript colon. We can now execute arbitrary JavaScript. For example, if I type print, this is actually going to execute the JavaScript print method. Let's try this. So although we associate location.href equals with a redirect, as you can see, it also takes raw JavaScript, which can be a problem. Returning back to our source code, we see that 
all this JavaScript code is doing is checking that the substring HTTP or HTTPS is actually found inside the URL that's part of the web message. It doesn't care about the position of HTTP or HTTPS, purely that it is found within the greater string. Okay, so why is that a problem? Well, we can simply make use of JavaScript comment characters. For example, if I set location.href to JavaScript colon print comment character HTTP colon, this is going to pass the JavaScript check, but what it's doing is still executing raw JavaScript. So that is the key concept of the exploit. Let's head to the exploit server and craft a payload. So remember that the idea behind this part of the lab, the exploit server, is we are imagining that a victim is visiting an attacker controlled domain. And on that domain, we're loading up an iframe with the URL of the vulnerable lab. The reason why we do things this way is because we can control the iframe to some extent. We can easily send web messages to the iframe. Now I'm copying the solution from the lab because the objective here is not to figure out the solution, but to understand the payload. So what's happening here? First of all, we are creating an iframe on the attacker controlled domain, and we have a source that represents the URL of our lab. Notice we have a constant here, your lab ID, which we need to replace with the ID of our lab instance. So let's do that right now. We're copying our lab ID, and we're replacing your lab ID with our instance of the lab. We then see that the iframe has an onload attribute. So this is something to be run once the iframe has finished loading. We have this, which refers to the iframe content window, which refers to the window object of the iframe. We're then calling the post message method. We're then calling JavaScript print. We have our comment character and HTTP. Remember the HTTP does nothing with respect to the JavaScript, but it does allow our string to pass the verification check in the page source. We then have a second argument passed to post message. This is the target origin. This refers to the allowed destination of the web message. And the asterisk means that it's a wildcard. This means that any destination is allowed for this particular web message. The way this works typically is if we have a specific target for the recipient of our web message, we will input the target origin as the second argument here. Could be a web address, for example. If this second argument does not match up with the recipient location, then the web message will never be dispatched in the first place. It's a security feature. It allows us to ensure that our web message is going to a recipient that's intended rather than being intercepted by a malicious actor. But of course, if we just use wildcard as the second argument there or the target origin as it's known, well, it really doesn't matter what the recipient is. The browser is going to dispatch this web message anyway. Let's choose the option to store the exploit. For a bit of fun, we can also view the exploit to see if it works. We see the iframe. We see that the print method has in fact been called. So this is proof of concept for cross-site scripting, DOM-based cross-site scripting attack. We saw we had a sync in terms of the location.href. In other words, the contents of the web message are ultimately ending up in that assignment to location.href, which we can refer to as our sync in cross-site scripting terms, because it's ultimately the DOM that ends up being edited as a result of that web message. We can refer to this as DOM-based cross-site scripting attack. The only thing that remains now is to solve the lab by choosing deliver exploit to victim. So this simulates a victim visiting the attacker controlled domain. Obviously when the victim gets there, the iframes loaded, the JavaScript is executed. We now get the message, congratulations, you solved the lab. So by way of a summary here, let's take a look at the solution, in particular the summary of how the exploit works. It reads, this script sends a web message containing an arbitrary JavaScript payload, that was our print method, along with the string HTTP. The second argument specifies that any target origin, i.e. the recipient, is allowed for the web message. When the iframe loads, the post message method sends the JavaScript payload to the main page, the event listener spots the HTTP string and proceeds to send the payload to the location.href sync. So first it goes through the check, it passes the check. The JavaScript on the main page says, well, this must be a URL. It's got HTTP in it, therefore it's clearly a valid URL. Actually not. Since it passes the check, that URL is then sent to location.href. And then finally the print function is called. And you might think, why is the print function called? And the answer is there's nothing specific about the print function. 
the print function represents the ability to execute arbitrary JavaScript. So obviously if you were a malicious actor, you're probably not going to be calling the print method in JavaScript. You're going to be using that JavaScript to do something malicious. The fact that we can call the print method arbitrarily indicates we have control of the JavaScript in the victim's browser. All right, so in summary, that was an example of DOM-based cross-site scripting attack, making use of a vulnerability in the way that web messages were handled. Thanks very much for checking out this walkthrough. Catch you guys in the next lab.